Suzanne introduced me and um, talked a little bit about um, some of the work that perhaps I've done in the past around improvement in, in healthcare. And today I wanted to really join with Stephen to look at some of the evidence base that we know about for improvement in healthcare and perhaps how it could be applied and how it has been applied to um, North Cumbria Primary Care Limited, which I work for. So that's really where I'm at to talk a little bit about it. Um, thankfully, Stephen's tour through the history and some of the points that he's made, I think I can safely say that we've encountered a number of those and can also say that it isn't linear and it's like a great big pot with all of these issues and challenges and opportunities in and trying to find your way through it is really, really complicated. And though we know all of that stuff, actually applying it is, is quite a challenge really. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about what we've been doing um, in primary care, but I think it's equally applicable in most other areas. So I put a title down about building continuous improvement into a new organisation. And you'll see as I go along, it's perhaps not such a new organisation and that we've inherited quite a legacy of other things such as cultures that already exist and it's very very rare that you can ever start with a blank piece of paper even when you think that you might be able to in a new organisation. So where are we? I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the organisation because not all of you are familiar with primary care but in GP practices, the traditional model has been for GPs to own, usually own the premises, sometimes rent them and have a contract which they deliver for primary care services. They run that as a business and that's been a very traditional sort of view of how um, a general practice would work. So they want to make a profit because they're self-employed and it's part of their business. So, of course, GPs are looking to serve patients and improve quality, but there's also an element of it being a private business that they are able to run as they would wish to run it. Now, those traditional models are being challenged, mainly because um, GPs don't necessarily want the responsibility of owning a business, employing all the staff, making that whole profit and still delivering all the demands that there are for healthcare. And there's been a change in the way that GPs work. We've seen, and Stephen said, there's very, full -time, very few full-time equivalent GPs anymore. We've got people that want portfolio work, they want to work in other care settings, that um, thankfully we've got a lot of uh, women GPs that perhaps want more flexibility for childcare. We have a number of GPs that want to do some locuming work, say work for an out of hours service too. So there's a need probably for a more modern approach to general practice. And that linked in with the fact that we've got a huge proportion of our GPs coming up to retirement age with very few waiting in the wings to replace them. And then if I overlay onto the top of that, we've got some of the most deprived areas in Cumbria where it's not attractive to go there and work. So when we talk about bringing new recruits into Cumbria, there's some great places to work, but there's also some really challenged places and practices that haven't been invested in, some buildings that are really quite poor and have often got the patients with the most need. So that's, that's the setting of where North Cumbria Primary Care came into. So it's a not-for-profit organisation and it was set up to really support some of the quite challenged practices, but also to look at a new model, 
where all the GPs were employed by NCPC. So they didn't have all of the probably responsibilities of a partnership. They were able to um, guarantee an income and we were hoping, and we have been able to, to offer more of that flexibility in portfolio working. So we started to look at this about two years ago. And of course, it was just before COVID. So all of this has been um, the backdrop for us as well. So practices were approached and asked, you know, did they want to join this new organisation? And we had many conversations with local practices and a number decided that they did and we bought their premises if they, if they owned premises and we offered them a contract which was working for us and we also tupid all of the staff over. So all of their staff they had in general practice came to work for us on the same terms and conditions that they already had. So the new model was to give GPs a chance to do what they really wanted to do clinically, not to tie them up in, in running a business, but also we wanted to offer each GP an improvement session to work across all of our practices that, that joined to do some improvement work, to look at where they could add value, and I'll talk a bit more about that, and to work a bit differently, so more collaboratively, less as competing businesses. So we took on some practices that quite honestly would have, have probably had to fold. And if that happens, they have to hand back their contract to the CCG and basically either the patients get allocated out to other practices, which puts more pressure on them, or very rarely the CCG can run that practice. So altogether, we had 18 sites now across Carlisle, Copeland and Workington. Now, the, not all of those are practices, so we've actually merged some of the practices, but we have 18 sites with GPs in each of those sites and practice staff and other clinical staff. And what we set out to do was work very differently. We've got a big population, which is a third of North Cumbria registered patients, and we're now up to about 450 staff. And I'm going to be honest here and say, I feel over the two years, we've grown too quickly. So some of what Stephen was talking about, about organisations being ready for improvement, and at the right stage to start to really look at some of the changes that need to be made, you need to stabilise some of what you've got. Otherwise, you're constantly focusing on that firefighting. And I'll be honest with you, for some of those practices, that's what we have had to do. So I'll talk to you about where I perhaps thought we would really start to to embed improvement and move forward with it as an organisation. But I will also talk honestly about the challenges we had, which is you know, just about creating some stability when you've got no staff. You've got to find the headspace to think about how to do things differently. And you can't because you've got patients coming through the door and you've got all of those things you've got to deliver. We're also host to three PCNs, so primary care networks, um, again another opportunity for primary care to work differently where practices group together and there's funding that's available to look at alternatives to the existing models of clinical care we have such as, and some of us are aware of this, of using all sorts of different types of clinicians and support posts that can help us work differently. So two years ago, I think my view was we could really embed improvement right from the word go, that we would look at something that was gonna work very differently. And some of that we've done, 
and some of it we're still, well, we've still got a long way to go, but some of it we've not really touched that much. So the opportunities that I feel that we had, using some of that evidence base, using some of experience of myself and others in the system, it was thinking about what could we actually do in a new organisation. So I wanted it to be part of our DNA. When we, we set up the organisation, how do we do that? So as Stephen said, we know a lot of that linear theory, we know a lot of what works, the evidence base, but how do you actually put all that together? And I think that is, is the challenge, really. So we looked at a very simple approach to our business model. So I'm not talking so much the clinical model here. So this is how we're going to do things around here. And we talked about it with our senior leader, leadership team and looked at how do you keep it simple that people could perhaps grasp that your business model is all about improvement. So what we looked at was, well, risks are opportunities for improvement. If we manage our risks or identify our risks, that could be a good place to start. And then there's other opportunities for improvement that come along too. So we simply based it on identifying risks and opportunities and having improvement plans, which then iterated round in what you're probably all familiar with, which is the PDSA cycle. So are we actually making improvements? Let's try it, see what happens, measure it and go round again in that cycle. So that was how our business model, which we tried to share in our leadership group, keep it simple and say, OK, what are the um, opportunities and improvements? But part of it is how do you identify those and how do you get everyone to, on board to understand that? So that's a challenge for us, which we're still looking at, but we have stuck with that model. We tried to embed the concept of value, which Stephen talked about, waste and the value being the absolute focus, and that has been our focus. So to look at value in terms of how can we add value in terms of safety, outcomes and experience for our staff and patients, that's absolutely runs right through what we're doing and we try to test that out for, for everything we are doing. The waste side of it, so we've got a number of 18 sites, number of practices, all doing things very differently. So when I said about how do we embed improvement into a new organisation, it isn't really a new organisation. It's the sum of all of the parts of other organisations that have joined us. So my assumption that we could maybe start with, you know, not such a blank piece of paper, but at least with, you know, something that we could say, this is how it's going to be. The reality is, is that all of these sites work differently. The other challenge is that if you go as a GP from running your own business to suddenly working for somebody and you're still in the same building, you've still got the same staff, the mindset change of that is massive. So there's all of those things to think about, which is why it's not just about the tools. It's about, and I'll talk a bit about the culture in a moment. So we focused on waste. We're using simple tools. As Stephen said, you know, you could go in and pick a number of tools that are going to help you. I think sometimes it's about knowing when the setting is appropriate. So some of the tools we're using, we use them without a big fanfare and they're just there. They're part of what we do. So we use A3 improvement sheets, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. We use um, the waste wheel, you know, and other simple tools like that to see waste differently and to think about opportunities for improvement. Again, that's not embedded all the way through all of those 18 sites. Over two years, it's taken us quite a bit 
to just start to bring some of these together, let alone starting to look at how we effectively develop and, and train some of our staff. You know, we've done things like bite-sized sessions, drop-in sessions, gone out to practices and worked with them, but we've still got a long way to go. So again, I think one of the keys for me is about small change, big difference. You know, we're all familiar with that, that working with staff that are really in, in a difficult situation with, with patients ringing up, we've got unprecedented demand. They don't know where to put those patients. You know, they've got no, we've, we've got limited capacity, all of those things. What can we do? How can we listen to you to make it a bit better for you to work in this environment? Then the larger scale change is an interesting one because part of what NCPC set up to do was to look at um, how we could improve quality of the services for our patients. Of course it is, but part of one of the pillars of doing that, we wanted to look at how we could contribute to the system, which is around population health and what impact we could have on that, because we are a large part of that population. And we also wanted to look at further upstream as um, Stephen has said, how can we activate patients to support some of that demand that's coming into the system? How can we signpost and redirect it? So we've looked at some of that larger scale change and how we can contribute, but we're still focusing on that whole stabilisation and embedding some of the rest of it first. Now I've put something here about tackling variation. You all know what I mean by that. Um, across all the practices we have, we've got massive variation. So our processes are all different. So a simple example, if you went into one practice in Copeland for a health check, you could have a variable experience in that practice, depending on which room you're sitting in, which member of staff is um, performing the health check, and you know, how many other people are waiting, all of those factors that are going to impact on your experience and outcome. Go to Carlisle and we've got a whole different set of variables that people, you know, are, are following, say, a different standard operating procedure for a health check. So all of our patients are getting variable outcomes. And we've got a massive amount of, you know, duplication and inefficiencies. So tackling some of that variation has been a really quite hard task and we're only just in the foothills of doing that. And the whole working differently is about also looking at how could we work differently with a different clinical model. So it's not just about all of our back office processing and systems that we've got, but we need to look at the clinical model of the future. How do we plan our workforce? Stephen said, you know, what do we want to see in the future? And it isn't what we've got now because there isn't any, you know, big influx of GPs. So we're investing in things like training and development and looking at new posts that might support us to do that. So I wanted to talk a bit more about culture because on reflection, when I came to, to think about what would I talk about here, there's all the sort of transactional and business stuff that I could talk about. And I could talk endlessly about budgets and about you know the structure that we've got, et cetera, et cetera. But the real key for it to me is about culture and understanding perhaps, or trying to understand the, the impact that culture has on improvement and whatever you're trying to do, whether it's in a new organisation or existing one. So for me, I didn't appreciate that we've got probably across the 18 sites, 18 different cultures based on the site, the staff, the geography, the building, you name it. And it really 
coming together is viewed as being, uh, you know, it's, it's such an opportunity we can do all these things. But coming together means agreeing how things are going to be and what your vision is, how you're going to work together. And culture is one of those tricky, slippery customers that you can't put your finger on, but actually stop you or hinder you um, when you think that you're making big changes, big improvements and taking everyone with you. And in actual fact, you're not. So we found that the values and behaviours, so we talk about values as NCPC, a bit like all of the people here in different organisations have their values, but actually seeing how people live those out across all of the different practices is a very different thing. So we talk about what we want to see, but some of our clinical leaders, some of our other management leaders don't always model those values and behaviours. And understanding some of the unwritten stuff which is out there is absolutely key. And I'll talk a bit more about um, some of this because Stephen referred to Edgar Shine and I think he puts it really well about understanding what that culture is, is at various levels. Communication, we talked about, I, I suppose, communication engagement with the staff, I know to be key, but has proved difficult with COVID. Opportunities like meeting have been very difficult or having any, any sort of events. And those to me are key to talking about what your beliefs are, how, you know, what your challenges are, and understanding from a staff perspective what they'd like to see and how they would like things to be. So Edgar Schein talked about a framework of cult for culture where you have these three levels, the first level called artifacts, the next one values, and the next one assumptions. So the artifact level is probably the, the most superficial level of culture. Just about if I went to a practice, I could pick up a lot by what I see. You know, you go in and there's in jokes in the practice, there's sort of people wearing certain clothing choices, there's GP parking spaces, you know, those sort of things tell you a bit about it and they're all different. The values are what we say that we're all perhaps signed up to and lots of our practices had values that they said that they they all you know demonstrated when they joined NCPC but in actual fact the last one which is the assumptions in this model tells us more about how all of our practices are working which is what people really do not just what they say how they work and what's accepted so one, one of the practices that joined us had four sites. They'd been working as four individual practices a few years ago and had joined together and were working as one practice. Now, my assumption wrongly was that they were very much integrated. They worked together. They had the same values, the same ways of doing things. But it actually turned out within that practice across the four sites, there was a completely different set of values, behaviours, culture, if you like. So, you know, sometimes just joining things together doesn't change anything. And also the assumptions we make. I mean, I, I, it's interesting that certain behaviours are allowed, which might be, you know, this is the hierarchy in this practice, which is GP has final say. That could be one of the things. It's not written down anywhere, but it is what people believe. And challenging that has proved to be quite difficult in some cases. So again, and I'm not sure where I pinch this from, I'm sure Stephen might tell me, but how is it that we are always and never the same? So GP practices, surely they're all the same. They employ staff GPs, they have the same types of, you know, idea of what they're delivering. So, you know, 
they're all the same, but they're not. They're very, very different. And then we talk about being integrated and particularly in healthcare and healthcare systems, but we still work autonomously as organisations and so on. So that's been a massive challenge for us to bring together all of these practices and to consider how we can work with people to, to do things differently. So I'm, I'm just going to end by saying that I think it's a balancing act and a big pot that we all have to dip into to try to look at how we embed improvement, you know, the values, we work in teams, that we develop our leadership. All of these things together have got to be done, not individually and in a linear way, but they've got to be worked on. And I don't think we've got it right, but we're trying. So that vision, the leadership commitment, I mean, Stephen and I have had chats about this forever. Having committed leaders to what you're doing, it, it's, it's absolutely vital. The method is there, we've talked about it. There's loads of tools, we can use those, we can use the expertise. Engagement with staff and engagement with other organisations is, is a big thing for us. We've got a joint post with Health Watch so that we can actually um, you know, talk to patients through an organisation that is for patients, engaging in the community, because it's really difficult to do that across with so many patients, but also engaging with staff, which we need to get better at. And that whole cultural awareness thing, not to make assumptions about, you know, everybody's working the same way because they're not. The values and behaviours and, and how we put ourselves out there, I think is so important. Um, as leaders in the system, I think that some of the evidence shows us if we don't walk the walk and talk the talk, people see through us immediately. And that's really important. So my final slide is just to remind us that, you know, we think about success as being this straight line. It's not. And I would say that as far as NCPC is concerned, we're, you know, down through the second sort of wibble down at the bottom there. And we're trying hard and we're trying to make those changes, but we've got a long way to go. Thank you.